read a story recently about a Siberian tiger that had gone out in, in search of a poacher. The poacher was found really badly mangled, and the forensic people went in to check out the case had to come to the conclusion that the tiger was actually stalking the poacher. Apparently the poacher had wounded that tiger several months before, and now the tiger was coming back to get its revenge. It's a good cautionary tale. Many times the things that we hope to feed off of, end up feeding off of us. The places where we look for our happiness, that we hope for gaining nourishment, tend to chew us up. The Buddha says as much. He talks about how suffering boils down to the five clinging aggregates. You've got the form clinging aggregate and the feeling clinging aggregate. The perception clinging aggregate, fabrications and consciousness clinging aggregates. And the word for clinging, upadana, can also mean sustenance. We try to feed off of these things. Particularly we try to feed off the, the pleasure that these things have to offer. We look for pleasure in physical things, we look for pleasant feelings, pleasant perceptions, pleasant things to think about or pleasant ways of thinking, pleasant things to be conscious of. That's where the mind looks for its sustenance. But the Buddha also has us reflect on the fact that we get chewed up by form, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness. to the places where we hope to feed end up chewing us up, spitting us out. As so John Sawat used to say, think about the sensual pleasure you had last week. Where is it now? It's gone. And the memory of pleasure is not necessarily a pleasant memory. Sometimes all you can think about is that you're not going to get that pleasure back. Or you may start thinking about the things you did in order to get that pleasure, which were not necessarily skillful. And that can eat at you. And our thoughts, as we've seen many times, can eat us up. especially when we think about the stupid and thoughtless things we've done in the past. Or ways in which we suffered in the past. And it's funny how the mind can feed off of these things, even though they're unpleasant, yet it goes back to them. Get some miserable pleasure out of them, but then it ends up getting eaten up by these things as well. It's like eating infected food. You swallow it down, but then it, you're swallowing down the, the germs in the food and they start eating away at your gut. So what do you do? One, you've got to learn how to eat uninfected things. Give the mind better nourishment. At the very least, the kind of nourishment that's not going to eat away at you. And this is what the path is all about. Because when we're practicing the path, we're taking those aggregates. And we're relating to them in a new way. We're using them as a path. We still feed off them, but we try to feed off of nourishing 
forms, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness. We focus on the breath. That's form. We focus on the sensations of the body. That's form. We try to work the breath through the body so it gives rise to pleasant feelings. That's feeling. We have to hold the perception of breath and body and mind, because otherwise the mind will wander off into other worlds. So you have to be mindful. You're going to stay with the breath. Keep remembering that so you don't lose your frame of reference. There's a very close connection between mindfulness and perception. You have to keep remembering you're going to stay with body, 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 or breath, breath, breath. And as it turns out, it's not just mindfulness, also concentration is also very closely connected to perception. You hold one perception in mind. Here again, it's the perception of breath. And then you're conscious of all these things. So you're taking the aggregates and you're putting, putting them together in a way that makes them healthy. They turn into health food, the kind of food that doesn't turn around and try to feed off of you or chew you up. It actually strengthens you. The mind is concentrated, settles down with a perception of breath, and you start thinking about breath energy and realizing it goes throughout the whole body. As you breathe in, breathe out. The breath sensations can be detected anywhere in the body if you're really sensitive. In the same way they can measure brain waves, no matter where they put the electrodes in your body. The breath energy permeates throughout the body, and you want to take that as a basis for allowing the pleasure that comes when the mind begins to settle down. It's not squeezing or pushing or pulling on the different sensations in the body, just allowing them to be. Let them develop a sense of fullness. That pleasure is nourishing. It's not like the pleasure of sensuality, which, as they say in Thai, is maybe good for your mouth but bad for your stomach. The pleasure form is the kind of food that's nourishing all the way through. So you've got the form and the feeling together. The perception, and then there's the fabrication that thinks about the breath, works with the breath. Evaluates the breathing, how well the pleasure is going. Evaluates the point where the pleasure is full enough so you don't have to evaluate much anymore. But just focus in on the breath sensations and just stay there with this expanded sense of awareness. That's where you're nourishing the body with good breath sensations, and you're nourishing the mind by allowing it to settle down and expand. So it's not forced to run around worrying about this and finagling that. It can do what it does best, it's simply be aware. This is good food for the body, good food for the mind. It's nourishment. The Buddha often compares this to medicine. In the same way, the good food can also be medicinal. It can be good for your health. And it's the kind of pleasure, the kind of nourishment that really does strengthen you. Because physical pleasure actually makes you weak. Because the mind keeps looking for things to be a certain way.
and gets upset when they're not that way, and develops all kinds of bad habits around pleasure. But if you develop the mindfulness, the alertness, the ability to direct your thoughts in the right direction, to evaluate things in the right way, you develop the skills that are useful for finding a sense of well-being, finding nourishment even in difficult situations. And that's strength right there, the ability to be independent. So things outside don't have to be a certain way for there to be a sense of well-being in the mind. This is how this good food develops the strengths of the mind, like conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. So the mind more and more can stand on its own two feet. And unlike physical food, the mind, when it feeds off mental food, feeds off the food of the path, will eventually reach a point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. And with the body, you always have to keep it feed, well fed. But with the mind, it reaches a point where it grows independent of food. That's what the Buddha says. It's like the arahant whose path can't be traced. As long as the mind is looking for food, you can trace its path as it goes checking its trap lines. But it no longer needs to feed. Okay. So this is like the path of birds through space that can't be traced. It's not feeding off of anyone. Nobody needs to feed off of it. That's when the mind is really free. It's hard to imagine because we are so used to feeding both, feeding off of physical food and feeding off mental food. But it's good to open your mind every now and then to think about these possibilities. So the more you open to the idea, the more likely that the possibility really will become an actuality for you. So always keep in mind, it is possible to become totally free. This is the Buddha's guarantee, the guarantee of all the noble disciples. And it's up to each of us to test that guarantee for ourselves.